Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Let's begin by taking a look at the last three days of total accumulated snowfall. The system that moved through the midsection of the United States today is plaguing parts of the Northeast, especially the interior of the Northeast, where we have blizzard warnings downwind of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, where they may get as much as one to two feet of snow today, uh, with the gusts uh, in the wind getting over 50 miles an hour at times. It's going to be a mainly a rainfall event along the coast, but still pretty nasty in the interior of the Northeast. Coming back, though, to what this system has already produced for us, I want to talk first about the snow swath that extended from Missouri through Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and parts of Ohio. The European model, as we reported on Monday, was the only model and, and certainly the first model to pick up on the southeastward trend uh, in, and also the lower snowfall amounts out of this system as it kind of pulled through the parts of the Midwest. And honestly, the model verified extremely well uh, on snowfall here. So that was an important trend that, that we picked up on early here, but still very challenging forecast. I think the most challenging challenging aspect of this, though, was what happened back in the high plains and in the central plains. Nearly every forecast model underestimated some of the heavy snow that came through parts of Montana, right there into parts of Wyoming and uh, in western South Dakota, especially in the Black Hills, where some reports in the Black Hills were over 30 inches. But I think a really tricky part was right down here, where just a couple of days ago, we were watching these bands of snow set up and were rather stationary, putting down some heavy mounts. And what was amazing was we were actually able to see that yesterday on the clearing skies in the central plains. So you're looking right down here, uh, centered on Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma. And uh, that swath of snow that you see right in through there, very narrow band, some locations here picking up nine inches of snow. That's just north of like Wichita, right there in the center part uh, of the state of Kansas. Impressive just to see that on satellite now that the skies have kind of cleared out. Well, the other thing that I thought was quite amazing, and I put this in my long range analysis yesterday, was this feature right here. So what you've got here is this is the subtropical branch of the jet stream feeding into the first system that went into the northeast and what was amazing about this and again I included this yesterday in my long range was the sharp cloud boundary that we saw right here in Louisiana so I showed you this picture I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to see it from Freightman Ken uh, parked here taking a, a, a really fantastic picture of that cloud edge but with our high resolution satellite imagery that came in we also got a snapshot of it here uh, from MODIS so you're staring down on Louisiana you can see the very fertile ground right here in the uh, lower Mississippi Mississippi River Valley and in the Delta. But look again, look at the shadow on the edge of that cloud field. Just spectacular to see stuff like this from space. Well, putting it all together over the last week, this is total accumulated precipitation here. And once again, we have really soaked parts of the southeast and parts of the Ohio River Valley, stretching all the way back to Kansas with these last few systems that have come through here. We've added a lot more rain on top of what has already been a very, very wet month of February. So thinking about that, I want to do a little bit of comparison. So the first map that you're going to see here is precipitation anomalies measured in inches uh, for the month of February 2020. We can see that some locations down here uh, stretching from Mississippi up into parts of Tennessee and getting over to the Carolinas are sitting in between a 5 and some locations approaching a 15 inch surplus in rainfall. Meanwhile, going back west, we can see that the split flow pattern has avoided California as we've been talking about so many times here. And I do have more discussion on the change happening in California in a few moments. But you can see where that has come in right here into the uh, and hitting the Cascade Mountains and really soaking parts of the Northeast. Now, we need context for this. So when I was thinking about how wet things were here, I just had to go back a year ago to see how wet it was back in 2019 during the same time period. But we had a much different flow pattern in February uh, 2019 than we did in 2020 for almost everywhere else around the country. So just take a look at this map. Look how much wetter it was in California and dry in the Northwest. We're also very wet here in parts of the North Central Corn Belt, uh, getting up into the Great Lakes states. So what we need to do is let's just understand the differences in the pattern. So I have 2019 February over here on the left and 2020 over here on the right. Now, the subtle differences, uh, well, maybe not so subtle. Look in 2019 at the deep western U.S. trough. The ridge over the southeast meant that the flow was doing just like this. Now, in 2020, what was interesting is the differences up here in Greenland. You notice how much lower the heights are here in the North Atlantic compared to a year ago. And you also see, going over to the North Pacific, the position of the ridge sitting here in 2020, where back in 2019 it was tucked in farther over to the west. And that's a critical thing I want you to be paying attention to as I go through this forecast video. So we had split flow this year 
coming together and running up over the ridge. And it's that ridge over the southeast that was the most common feature between these two maps. And that, once again, pumps in the moisture from the Gulf and gives us such wet conditions over the southeast. Now, I want you to keep this analysis fresh in your mind as I go through this forecast. The consequence of that pattern, though, take a look at this. I was just very curious when looking so far at the start of 2020, what percentage of the days compared to average have seen above average daily temperatures? So in other words, if you look at all the days so far this year, what percentage of them have been warmer than normal versus colder? And I just color coded everything greater than 50% with this, these reds here. And what you're noticing is so much of the United States, with the exception of parts of the Intermountain West, has seen 60, 70, even 80% of the days so far in 2020 uh, with above average temperatures. Look at this right around the Great Lakes states getting in here into parts of the Ohio Valley. A lot of 70s and 80s. So that sets 80% of the days with above average temperatures. Well, the other thing that we need to be paying attention to is our severe weather. Because right now, so far through this year, you can see that much of that's been concentrated in that area that's been extremely wet. And as of today, we're currently sitting at the second most active uh, year in terms of tornado count through this point in February. Uh, but we're now getting into a time period where severe weather begins to ramp up. And so, uh, kind of piggybacking on the long-range outlook I produced yesterday, uh, early this morning, the Storm Prediction Center is now in agreement with some of what we've been discussing, and that is on the lookout for next Tuesday, right in this area, for the potential for severe weather. And we've got to be talking about what is going on there. So let's just get through a near-term forecast. Here we go. There's a system rolling through parts of the, the northeast. We have behind it a little, uh, it's almost like a little clipper coming around the backside of, of the broader trough. Let me just show it to you again. So you can see the system pulling through the northeast throughout the morning this morning into this afternoon, getting us those heavy snow bands coming off the end of our Great Lakes. Turn your attention now to the middle part of the United States, because through midday today, getting into this afternoon, this evening, got some light snow that's sneaking through parts of the Dakotas, Minnesota, Iowa. You can see it there. And even some light snow still on the backside of this system, pushing through parts of the Ohio River Valley right in through here. Well, as we get into the day on Friday, we can see that light snow pulling through parts of the Midwest. Very light snow. This isn't much to talk about here. And it slides here into the Appalachian Mountains where we could get some more snow uh, Friday evening getting into early Saturday morning. So that's it. Okay. Otherwise, relatively quiet across much of the rest of the country. So what are we watching next? Well, I want to show you how it evolves in temperatures first. So behind the system that's exiting in the Northeast, we do have some cooler weather to deal with. So you can see that as I pull you through Friday, getting into Saturday, the east is really cooling off behind the system, but it's been short-lived just like every other cold air blast that we've had. We see that by Sunday, getting into Monday, look at the warmth rebounding across the midsection of the United States. Now, my concern is what's going to be happening once we get into Monday night and then into Tuesday. Look at that. See that warm up that's happening there? The only way that this happens is for a trough to dig into the west and then lift out to the northeast and that pulls the heat in and the moisture. And my concern has been the severe weather happening potentially next Tuesday night. So let's get to that and try to understand it. Now watch this. This is an animation of vorticity. So we're looking at spin in the atmosphere. As I play this forward, this is the exiting low pressure system that's going through the north Northeast. You will see a few little pockets of higher values of vorticity sliding around the back side of this. So see this one coming in right through here? This one and this one are the two that are bringing the light snow chances from the Dakotas uh, through parts of Missouri, Illinois, and then over into the Appalachian Mountains. Now behind that, you can now see the flow pattern. See this? Here are the, the, the broader ridge moving through the United States with a little short wave just to the north of it going through parts uh, of the Canadian prairies. But I want you to watch California. Because once we get out here uh, through the day on Sunday into Monday morning, look at this really powerful wave sneaking through the Baja of California. Now my concern is as that wave pulls through parts of Mexico and then into Texas, this is now Tuesday evening. That main wave is sitting right here. And this is telling me that we need to be watching uh, for excellent upper level support with strong winds coming out of the west southwest right around this trough here, potentially giving us the risk for some severe weather. So to show you that same time period, I want to now step down in the atmosphere. We call this feature here, 
that will be out ahead of that main shortwave which is sitting there. This thing is called the low level jet. So we're seeing here wind speeds being forecast by the uh, by the model here at 50 to 70 miles an hour screaming out of the south. So what this does is this provides the wind shear necessary such that if we erupt thunderstorms on the unstable air mass that is in place, that's the map that's over there on the right, these storms are going to have the ability to rotate. We've now seen about five model runs in a row that has suggested that that time period uh, next Tuesday evening looks to be uh, the, the, the time period where I'm most concerned. I'll just draw it on this map about this region right in through here. Okay, so timing on this could change. We're going to watch it all the rest of this week and the beginning of next week and over the weekend. But I want everybody that lives down here in, in parts of eastern Texas, eastern Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, even southern Missouri. Missouri, getting over into Tennessee, Kentucky. Watch it. Watch this next system coming through because it is looking quite potent. So let's look at the timing of it by going over to our European model. First, this morning, look at the wind field around the low pressure center that's sitting in the northeast. Very, very strong winds. Well, that system moves through. You're going to see the little clippers coming around. Remember, we talked about those, but a relatively drier time period in the midsection of the country as we work through Saturday into Sunday. Now remember, we had that one wave moving through parts uh, uh, coming out of Alberta into Saskatchewan. Well, right there is the center of the low, and you can see the, the snow that's wrapped around the back side of that. But the main show's coming into California Monday, well, Sunday night into Monday morning. Here it is. So bringing in some precip here into parts of uh, Southern California. And while that is moving in, it's critical to get this high pressure cell here off the southeast coast. Now I say critical in order for this setup to work because if this moves off the southeast coast, we bring the clockwise circulation, returning the warmth, returning the moisture right into this area. So this is the setup for this potential severe weather event. So you can see that on Monday, widespread scattered showers with thunderstorms to the south uh, all throughout this region on Monday. Okay, getting into Tuesday now. This is where we see one frontal band sitting here, the next low pressure system taking shape here, and it's gonna ride that frontal boundary right in through this area. So watch this. System shows up Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon, and Tuesday evening. So see how it just pulled right there along that main frontal boundary? This is the time period I'm now concerned about for the severe weather outbreak right in through this area. And it may be a multi-day event because as we go through in the day on Wednesday, you can see pulling over to Wednesday afternoon, that severe weather threat could shift over here into parts of the Mid-South, getting over to Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia as well. And as that system pulls on toward the north and east, another extremely windy, powerful low pressure system uh, by next Thursday morning, afternoon, and evening. Then it shows, at least in the operational model, things calm down again as high pressure moves in and the temperatures cool off behind this one. But I don't think we're slowing this pattern down at all. So let's take a look at total accumulated precipitation out of this next system. And we can see, remember, that the, the one system skirting through here leaving a frontal boundary right here. The next low shows up there and runs along that frontal boundary, which is why we see in this area that I just analyzed for you to show you how wet it was this year compared to a year ago, we do have the potential in here of grabbing at least another two and a half to three inches of rainfall. This will continue our flooding problems on the Mississippi, on the Missouri, and on the Ohio River, and all of its all of the tributaries to those rivers right in this area. So look out for this as we progress uh, into the middle of next week. Now, beyond that, it appears that we get things trying to calm down here, but I'm, I'm kind of leery of this because you're going to see in the pattern we're setting up a west coast trough, and usually that does not translate into drier weather into this area. It still doesn't negate the fact that everywhere underneath what I'm shading here, we have anywhere between a two and six inch soil moisture surplus, and we will be adding before we get to this time period a whole lot of rainfall right into this area. But for those of you in California, you can now start to see what we've been talking about for the last few weeks here with the change in pattern happening after about March 6th, 7th, and 8th. Now we see some weather anomalies. We need to discuss why that is. Because up to this point right now, we are sitting at about 50 to 60% of normal snowfall in the Sierra Nevada. And compared to a year ago, look at what the snowpack looked like a year ago at this time. So this is critical that this pattern changes. And this is what it looks like. Ready? So this is now valid for the system coming through early next week. Week. The ridge is sitting here. The main anchors for cold are sitting in the North Atlantic and in the Arctic. Trough one, trough two. This is the trough that sweeps through bringing in all the unsettled and severe weather. 
Now, as we look out here to day 10, that trough is now swept over here. Ridging builds back in, which is why we saw temporarily the drier time period after the system coming through next week. But now we start to see that ridge that was once in the Gulf of Alaska moving to the west toward the Aleutian Islands. And that is allowing for the development of a broader trough feature in through here. And if you go back to the beginning of this video, that is something we have not seen at all since the start of the new year. So what does this mean? The flow is now getting directed like this, and that changes everything for California. Again, once we get past the 7th and 8th of the month. So let's see what happens now, getting all the way to the 12th. Our ridge is now retreated. Main cold anchor is here. There's the broader trough. This brings in the moisture into California. This relaxes the pattern and warms things up, but it also means moisture returns to the north, which is why I cannot say that we actually do go over to a drier pattern here in the midsection of the United States toward the east. Because with that trough hanging out out there in the west, it looks as though we have good chances of, of, of you know seeing an active storm pattern. So to show you what I talked about at the beginning, take a look. This was what we've been in so far this year. And the key difference is right here. Notice the position of the ridge that we've had up to this point in the year sliding back now in this direction to be sitting here. That's the critical shift overall that is happening in this flow pattern, allowing for this trough here to connect across the west coast. So that's going to bring in the weather, weather pattern for California in the forecast. Let's keep a close eye on that one. What's it going to do to temperatures? Well, over the next five days, still have the cooler weather exiting here. But remember, we're returning all of that warmth to the midsection of the country out ahead of the next system. So days five through 10 are reflecting that, which is what you see here with the warmer than average conditions over that time period, stretching uh, all the way over there to the eastern part of the United States. But take a look. With the jet stream doing something like this now, by the time we get out here day 10 through 15, the latest models have gone back over to the warmer pattern. And I would encourage you to watch yesterday's long range outlook because I discuss what each one of these teleconnection patterns is doing to influence this pattern. Uh, but certainly with the Arctic oscillation so very positive and a stable polar vortex, what stratospheric polar vortex, getting sustained cold into the United States is very limited uh, at best. So go take a look at that video because uh, it'll explain what all those teleconnections are doing. Now, the other consequence of the pattern setting up across the United States is this. Europe is continuing on its very, very warm winter. Over the next 10 plus days, look around the Black Sea region. We're continuing to see much above average temperatures. So I made a similar map to the one I showed you at the beginning of this video, looking at the last 60 days, looking at the percent of those days where we were above average you can see that parts of northern Europe in here haven't seen a day below average. We have a lot of 70s, 80s, and 90s across Europe. It has been an extremely warm second two-thirds of winter here for Europe, and nothing is slowing that down anytime soon in and around the Black Sea. To finish this up, I want to give you another recap of what's going on down here in South America. Please pause the video and read the bullet points I have over there on the left about what's going on with the crop. Most important components I want to discuss is we're keeping Brazil's eastern growing regions very wet and parts of Mato Grosso very wet where we're still trying to rapidly harvest the, what's left of the beans and get the safrinha corn planted. We are now seeing, this is, uh, gosh, this is the sixth model run in a row that is showing drier conditions in Brazil's southern growing regions and also in Argentina. And that must be watched carefully through the coming weeks as it could potentially um, cause problems with safrinha crop in Brazil and full season crop down here in Argentina. Let's watch it together as the forecast progresses through the end of February and into March, okay? With that, we're going to go to wrap it up right here. Hope you all have a great end to your week, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you.